Systemic and structural problems in China's economy are emerging, while its zero COVID policy have accelerated the deterioration of the economy even more. China's National Bureau of Statistics released data on July 15th that showed a preliminary estimate of gross domestic product of 56.26 trillion yuan in the first half of the year, up 2.5 percent at constant prices. Of this, gross was only 0.4 percent in the second quarter. By region, the best performer was the Ningxia Hui Autonomous Region, which grew 5.3 percent in the first half of the year. In the same period of last year, Ningxia ranked third from the bottom among 31 provincial administrative regions, which includes provinces, cities, and autonomous regions. Ningxia's economy accounted for 0.4 percent of the country's total. The worst economic growth was in Jilin Province, which shrank by 6 percent. The second worst was Shanghai, down 5.7 percent. That's why there is a saying on the internet. Neither Shanghai nor Ningxia thought this day would have come. Overall, China's economic development in the first half of 2022 was disappointing, especially in the second quarter, when the national year-on-year -year growth rate was only 0.4 percent, with five regions showing negative growth year-on-year: -year. Shanghai minus 13.7 percent, Jilin minus 4.5 percent, Beijing minus 2.9 percent. Hainan minus 2.5 percent and Jiangsu minus 1.1 percent. In fact, under the Communist Party's zero COVID policy, many places have seen a wave of business closures. According to incomplete statistics, by the end of June, 460,000 enterprises had closed down in China, and 3.1 million individual businesses have been dissolved. In April, the number of businesses being liquidated soared more than 23 percent year on year. The performance in the first half of the year was worse than economists had expected. The full year target of 5.5 percent economic growth for China does not look achievable. The most economically developed regions in China are the five southeastern coastal provinces and cities, namely Guangdong, Jiangsu, Fujian, Zhejiang, and Shanghai. These regions account for more than one third of the country's total economic output, nearly 40 percent of fiscal revenue, and contribute nearly 80 percent of the net local contribution to the central government. But from the economic data of the first half of the year, the situation in these five southeastern provinces and cities is not very optimistic. In terms of economic growth. Only Fujian, 4.6 percent, exceeded the national level of 2.5 percent among the five provinces and cities. Zhejiang barely reached the average line, and Guangdong, 2 percent, Jiangsu, 1.6 percent, and Shanghai, minus 5.7 percent, are ranked in the bottom eight. What is even more disturbing than the low GDP growth rate is the financial situation of these provinces and cities. In the first half of the year, the amount of local general public budget revenue totaled 5.756 trillion yuan, up 4.7 percent year on year. Among the five southeastern provinces and cities, only Fujian, 6.7 percent, had an above-average revenue growth rate, but it was only ranked 16th. The other four provinces and cities, revenue growth was below the passing line of 4.7 percent. Among them. Guangdong minus 0.5, Jiangsu minus 5.8, and Shanghai minus 12.9 percent all recorded negative values, accounting for almost half of the seven provinces and cities with negative revenue growth. One can foresee that the fiscal deficit of the central government will definitely rise significantly this year. Shanghai, the leading economy in China, had a particularly bad second quarter. The absolute value of GDP in the second quarter was 933.9 billion yuan, about 140 billion U.S. dollars, a drop of 13.7 percent year on year. Shanghai, China's largest economic, financial, trade, and shipping city, is often referred to by the Chinese as Greater Shanghai. Although Shanghai accounts for less than one one thousandth of China's land area. It has, for years, accounted for about four percent of the country's GDP, ranking as the top city in mainland China. 
Shanghai has been one of the major money pockets for the Communist Party's central government. Shanghai's total tax revenue has long accounted for more than 10% of the country's tax revenue. In 2021, for example, China's general public revenue totaled 20.25 trillion yuan, about 3 trillion U.S. dollars, of which about 85% came from taxes. Shanghai's tax revenue in that year was 1.87 trillion yuan, accounting for more than 10% of the country's tax revenue. Shin Kaiyan, director of the Institute of Economic Research at the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences, said April and May in particular, with Shanghai's region-wide static management, the investment, consumption, import and export, and other economic activities were greatly restricted. And as a result, negative economic growth in the first half of the year was predictable. The RFI also commented on July 16th that many experts did not hesitate to blame the zero COVID policy for the major causes of the economic downturn. The article said that the hard lessons from the lockdown of Shanghai and several major cities, and even some provinces in the Northeast, show that the collateral and humanitarian disasters caused by the lockdowns are incalculable. And far outweigh the disasters caused by the epidemic itself. In addition to the gross product, which is the public's main concern, several other major economic indicators in Shanghai declined accordingly. Among them, local general public budget revenue fell 19.8 percent. The added value of the secondary industry dropped 13.7 percent. Total social fixed asset investment fell 19.6 percent. And total retail sales of consumer goods dropped 16.1 percent. The contraction of Shanghai's economy has not only impacted Shanghai people, enterprises, and foreign workers, but also affected the upstream and downstream industrial chains of many industries across the whole country. Many economists describe the economic problems that Shanghai encountered as unprecedented. The economic contraction was accompanied by a soaring unemployment rate. On July 15th, the National Bureau of Statistics released data showing that the National Urban Survey unemployment rate averaged 5.7 percent in the first half of the year, including an average of 5.8 percent in the second quarter. It is important to know that the rural population of about 600 million people is not counted in this unemployment rate. In June, the unemployment rate of urban youth aged 16 to 24 climbed to 19.3 percent, a 25 percent increase over the same period last year. The unemployment rates in April and May this year were 18.2 percent and 18.4 percent, respectively. China's urban youth unemployment rate has been on an upward trend. Based on a population of 210 million between the ages of 16 and 24, the number of unemployed young people in China has exceeded 40 million this year. The number of college graduates in China is around 10 million every year, and the number of college students graduating this year is 10.76 million, another record high. Many college students are facing unemployment as soon as they graduate. Bank of America Securities, in a report in June, predicted that the unemployment rate of young people in China could reach 23 percent in July and August. A Netizen posted pictures showing an electronics factory hiring student workers for five yuan per hour. China is set to see the biggest wave of retirements in its history at a time when the country's economy is on a downward spiral and youth unemployment is at a record high. According to a report from the Daily Economic News on July 21st, in 2022, men born in 1962 will reach the retirement age of 60, and most ordinary female workers born in 1972 will also retire this year. The report said the number of retirees in many provinces has reached millions, including more than three million in Beijing, Jiangxi, Inner Mongolia, and other places, more than seven million in Guangdong. And as high as 9.15 million in Zhejiang. Earlier, the official media Half Months Talk published an article saying that for the next 10 years to come, China will usher in the biggest retirement wave in history, and people who were born in 1960s will gradually retire, with an annual average of 20 million people. 
Peng Xizhe, director of Fudan University's Institute on Aged People, said that according to the latest data from the Communist Party's Bureau of Statistics, the population aged 60 and above will be 267.36 million in 2021, accounting for 18.9 percent of the national population, with 20.56 million people aged 65 and above, accounting for 14.2 percent of the national population. On the other hand, the new potential labor supply increase will only be roughly 17 to 18 million each year. That is, the working age population will decrease by 3 to 5 million per year. Peng Xizhe pointed out that as the number of retirees increase, the number of pension recipients also increase. However, with the number of retirees exceeding the number of new workers, the number of people who contribute to pension will also continue to decline. Last year, the shortage of basic pensions, which is the main pillar of China's pensions, reached 700 billion yuan. The China Insurance Association reports that the nation's pension shortfall is expected to be 8 to 10 trillion yuan over the next 10 years. As China's population ages, the demographic dividend is gradually disappearing. It has dealt a heavy blow to China's economy. To save the economy, the top echelon of the Communist Party is also taking some measures. Xi Jinping still wants to engage in infrastructure construction investment to boost the economy. And in April this year, he chaired the fourth meeting of the Central Finance and Economics Commission and put forward his idea, which is little different from the previous infrastructure construction routine. The main parts of the high-speed rail network and highway network is already in place and it's impossible to tear them down and rebuild. So he advocates building a number of regional airports, cargo airports, as well as upgrading coastal and river ports to boost water transport. In addition, he advocates to build a high-tech infrastructure of cloud computing and information technology. According to the analysis of Mr. Wen Zhao, a current affairs commentator, such huge investment involves heavy capital, China's high-speed railway network has been losing money since the day it was built. In the third quarter of 2021, when the epidemic was relatively mild, the China Railway Group still lost 69.8 billion yuan. The total debt of China's high-speed railways reached 6 trillion yuan in 2020, while the last wave of infrastructure to stimulate the economy is still far from absorbing the huge debt Investing in regional airports and inland waterways will also incur losses. These infrastructures will disperse highway and railway freight, exacerbating the existing losses of the road and rail network. River shipping has long been a sunset industry because it is slow, requiring large investment, and seasonal. Most inland waterways are affected by high and low water seasons, and their capacity is unstable throughout the year. It is more suitable for bulk commodity transportation such as ore and coal, and the customers are restricted to a small number of corporate users who purchase a few times a year at fixed times, and are less concerned about the speed and more concerned about reducing freight costs. Is there a need to revive inland river ports? Wen Zhao said it depends on the current industrial layout. Many enterprises consuming bulk commodities and steel mills, thermal power plants are not built by the river routes. So what is the point to increase the transport capacity of inner rivers? He pointed out that what Xi Jinping wants are big, large, high-level designs, the Millennium Plans. He's not able to think straight at a deeper level. Li Keqiang said that he could not agree with Xi Jinping's plan which is why he mentioned twice in his speech at the World Economic Forum on July 20th that he would not engage in the big water irrigation. The term big water irrigation is a term invented by Li Keqiang and originated from agriculture. Water here refers to financial liquidity, meaning that bank credit is no longer allowed to grow too fast. The reason for the rapid growth of bank lending in China over the past 20 years has been real estate development, railroad, highway, airport, water conservancy, and other major infrastructure construction. The financing of real estate companies has long been tightened through the three red tapes, 
and Li Keqiang is now saying no to big water irrigation, means he will not cooperate with Xi Jinping in the construction of infrastructure. You, Xi Jinping, please feel free to show the direction and blueprints and mention your grand plans. I, Li Keqiang, will control the banking system and not provide the money so as to prevent the rise of bad debts in banks and to maintain financial security. So in terms of the bailout programs, Xi and Li are secretly competing. However, Li Keqiang can't give a good plan either to save China's economy. Domestically, the CCP is pushing a policy that the state enterprises advance, the private sectors retreat. Internationally, the CCP is pushing the war-wolf diplomacy that accelerates China's decoupling from the world. As China's population is aging, the demographic dividend is disappearing. Under such circumstances, the CCP still insists on implementing the strict policy of zero COVID. The so-called world's second largest economy is already as rotten as its tofu drag projects, and it may not be long for one to see its sun collapse.